In this video, I want to talk about a really important and kind of difficult uh, question to answer in astronomy, which is how far away stuff is. It turns out that measuring distances to things in space is one of the most um, tricky aspects of knowing things about objects um, in the sky. And the reason is that when we look at something that's very, very far away from us, we don't know exactly what we're looking at. And we don't know how big it is or how bright it is. If you don't know how big or how bright something is, it's hard to know what it is you're looking at. If we're here on the Earth and we're looking at a star, and by the way, stars are way further away than this. I just can't put them all on the same screen, right? This is, that star's closer to the Earth than Mars. But when we're looking at a star, we might see a star that looks really, really bright in the sky. We go outside at night, some stars are bright, some stars are dim, right? You look at a bright star like Sirius. Why is that star bright? Is that star bright because it is a really bright star? Or is that star bright because it is really, really close to us? We can even imagine that this star would look brighter in our sky than that star, even though that star is giving off much more light because this star is way, way closer. If stars have different true brightnesses, and the word we use in astronomy to talk about how bright something really is is its luminosity. Luminosity we use to refer to how much light something gives off. Brightness we use to refer to what something looks like to us here on Earth. So we can imagine a very luminous star that doesn't look very bright because it's very, very far away. And we can imagine a star with a very low luminosity that looks bright because it's really, really close to us. How do we disentangle those two pieces of information? It's a bit of a paradox. If we don't know how far away it is, we can't tell how luminous it is. And if we don't know how luminous it is, we can't easily judge how far away it is. Luckily, there, is, there are a few techniques that we can use for directly measuring the brightness of a star. Again, this picture is grossly out of scale. This is the sun, this is the earth. The earth goes around the sun in a little orbit. The stars are very far away, and some of the stars are very, very, very far away. As the earth goes around the sun, if we pick a point out in space, we are looking at that point from slightly different angles as the Earth moves in its orbit around the Sun. You have probably uh, done this little demonstration where you take your finger and you hold it out at arm's length and you close one eye and then you close your other eye and you look at your finger from the point of view of your two different eyes and what happens is your finger looks like it's moving back and forth because your right eye is looking at it from one angle and your left eye is looking at it from another angle and that angle changes as you change which eye you're using. That phenomenon is called parallax. Parallax is what your brain uses, at least in part, to judge how far away an object is. You are always looking at an object from two slightly different points of view. And when an object is close to you, your brain figures out, all right, my left eye sees it here, my right eye sees it here. I know where it is. I can reach out and grab that object. Um, it also uses other cues like lighting and shadows and how big the object is, if you know what the object is. But parallax is one of the useful features of having two eyes that both look at the same object for judging distances. So if we are looking at a star from two slightly different vantage points, imagine this is Earth in January and this is Earth in July. When I am here, here, I am looking at that star from this angle and it appears at one point in the sky relative to the stars that are much further away. When I look at that star from here, that star appears to be in a different point of the sky, just like your finger when you look at it from two slightly different angles. It's lined up with something different in the background. If we measure that shift and we know this distance, which we do, this is the distance from the Earth to the Sun, that's 93 million miles, about 150 million kilometers. If we measure this angle and we know this distance, it's simple trigonometry to figure out this distance, the distance from our solar system to that star. So if we are able to see this shift, and by the way, the shift is much, much smaller than I've drawn in this picture, right? Stars are very far away, so this shift is very, very tiny. But if we can measure that shift, we can measure the distance to the star. So using parallax, we can directly measure the distance to stars as long as they're not too far away and determine their distance. 
how do we define not too far away? The star has to be close enough that we can see this shift back and forth, which is a very, very tiny shift because this distance is small and the distance to the stars is pretty big. We define a unit of measurement that corresponds to this shift. We measure angles and degrees, right? There's 360 degrees in a circle. We call 1 60th of a degree a minute. We call 1 60th of a minute a second, just like in time we call a 60th of an hour a minute, a 60th of a, a minute a second. A 60th of a 60th of a degree is one arc second. It's a tiny, tiny angle. Picture, three, picture a protractor, picture one degree on that protractor. Now imagine dividing that into 60 slices and dividing each of those into 60 slices. An arc second is a very, very tiny angle. If we look at an object and we measure its parallax to be one arc second, one thirty-six thousandth or thirty-six hundredth of a degree, we call this distance a parsec. A parsec is an abbreviation for parallax second. And the distance that something has to be away to have a parallax of one second of arc, one second of degree, is about three and a quarter light years. So a parsec is a distance unit equal to 3.25 light years. It sounds like a time unit. It's not a time unit. It's a distance unit. There's a scene in the original Star Wars movie where Han Solo says the Millennium Falcon made the Kessel Run in under, I think it's 12 parsecs. Um, that doesn't make any sense. A uh, parsec is a time. They, uh, they retconned it in the, the Solo movie to make sense, but it doesn't make sense. It was a mistake. Okay, so a parallax second or a parsec is a unit of distance equal to about three and a quarter light years. Parallax is fine for measuring distances as long as we can measure that angle. But that angle, the further away the star gets, the tinier and tinier and tinier that angle gets in the sky. So for very distant stars, this shift is too small to be useful. How far out can we use parallax? Using our best ground-based telescopes with the highest resolution to be able to see the position of a star shift a little bit from January to June, we can measure parallax angles of about one uh, hundredth of uh, an arc second, which means we can measure distances out to about a hundred parsecs. hundred parsecs is about 325 light years. Um, there's not too many stars within 325 light years of the Earth. The closest stars are 4, 10, 12, 20 light years away. But this only gives us accurate distances to a few hundred stars. Why can't we just build bigger and better telescopes? Because when you're looking at the sky from the ground, you are looking through the atmosphere. And the atmosphere distorts the image that we see of the stars. And you cannot get a measurement better than a hundredth of an arc second looking through the atmosphere. That's about the amount that the atmosphere, that's the amount of um, uh, precision that the atmosphere will allow. That's why we build space telescopes to get out of the atmosphere. Um, so. From the ground, we can get out to about 325 light years. If we want to do better, we have to put a telescope out in space. There's a mission called Hipparchos, launched by the European Space Agency, which measured parallax angles as small as 1 1,000th of an arc second. That's 10 times better than our ground-based telescopes. That gets us out to about 3,000 light years. There's about 100,000 stars within 3,000 light years of the Earth. So getting from the Earth up into space to do our parallax measurements allows us to measure parallax of 100,000 stars. The reason the number is so much bigger, by the way, is if you picture a sphere around the Earth, the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So if you make your sphere 10 times bigger, that's not 10 times as many stars, that's not 10 times as much space in that sphere. A 10 times bigger sphere has 10 cubed 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times as much space in it. So if your parallax measurements get 10 times better, that's a thousand times more stars inside that bubble that you can detect their little parallax because your distance measurements are good enough. More recently, the Gaia spacecraft, which was launched a few years ago, is going to be operating until about 2025 or so, is actually placed in an orbit around the sun further away from the Earth. So the distance that it moves 
from January to July or from one point in its orbit to another point in its orbit is bigger. That allows Gaia to measure uh, angles as small as one, what is that, point zero 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 one. That's one millionth of, no, one ten thousandth of an arc second. That gets us out to distances of 30,000 light years, which is uh, as far as the center of our Milky Way galaxy. That lets us measure the distance to about 200 million stars. So there are 200 million stars in our galaxy that we can measure the distances to directly using parallax measurements conducted from space. Great. Well, the universe is a lot bigger than just our galaxy. Parallax is not useful at all for measuring distances to stars on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy, or stars in the Andromeda galaxy, or the Andromeda galaxy itself, or galaxies that are millions or billions of light years away from the Earth. Parallax only gets us the distances to the closest stars in our little neighborhood here in the Milky Way galaxy. How do we do better than that? Well, again, I said that part of the problem is that when you look out in space, you don't know how bright something really is unless you know the distance to it. Because you don't know if that object looks bright or is bright. It would be great if there were certain objects in the universe that were always the same brightness. So that when you looked at that object, you would say, oh, that's a whatever, and I know how bright a whatever is, so I know how far away it is. A good example from everyday life is like car headlights. Car headlights are all about the same brightness and they're all about the same distance apart. Yes, there are trucks and yes, there are Mini Coopers, but within a factor of two at least, all headlights are about the same distance apart and about the same brightness. When you are outside at night and you see a car, you can tell how far away that car is because you know how bright headlights are and you know how far apart headlights are. So all you have to do is see a car and say, oh, it's safe to cross the street or it's not safe to cross the street because you can see how far away that is. You can think of car headlights as being what astronomers call a standard candle. A standard candle is an object that is always the same brightness. We know it's always the same brightness. So since we know it's real brightness or it's real luminosity, when we see it, we can say, oh, that's one of those. I know how bright that is. And since I know how bright it really is, I can tell how far away it is. That is a standard candle. Standard candles are very important and rare in astronomy to find an object whose brightness you know just by looking at it because you know what it is. I'll give you one example of a standard candle. Uh, standard candle. There is a type of star called a Cepheid variable star, uh, named after the constellation which they were first observed, the constellation of Cepheus. Um, some, charge, some stars change their brightness. They get brighter and dimmer over the course of days, weeks, months. Um, they've known about these since ancient times. There are some that you can tell with the naked eye. If you look at the sky every single night and notice the stars in the constellations, you can see that star looks dimmer than it was last week. And then you look at it next week and you notice that over the course of several weeks, it gets brighter and dimmer, brighter and dimmer. We won't talk much about why this happens. Um, maybe I'll give you guys a video when we talk about stars explaining why some stars are variable. Just accept the fact that some stars vary in brightness. Um, some stars vary in brightness in a particular pattern that allows us to classify them. There are Cepheid variables and RR Lyra variables and all these different kinds of variable stars. Um, this particular pattern of, of fading slowly and then brightening quickly and then fading slowly in a roughly linear pattern, this kind of sawtooth pattern of brightening and dimming, dimming um, is what the what uh, is the characteristic shape of what's called the light curve, the change in brightness of a Cepheid variable. There is a curious relationship, if you look at all the Cepheid variables in the sky, between their say their maximum brightness and how fast they change brightness. The really bright ones change brightness slowly. The dimmer ones change brightness more quickly. And this relationship is shared by all Cepheid variable stars. If you look at a thousand Cepheid variables in our galaxy, 
and you measure their period, how long it takes them to change brightness, and their luminosity, their maximum brightness. You get a graph that looks like this. Period is on the horizontal axis, so um, slow period, fast period, and their actual brightness is on the vertical axis, so dim to bright. And yeah, there's some weirdness going on here where there's actually a, like a type one and type two that the graph splits, but for the most part, there's a very clear mathematical relationship between how bright the Cepheid is and how quickly it varies its brightness. What that means is, if you look at a Cepheid variable star that's very far away, and you just measure its period, how quickly it changes its brightness. You can come to this graph and say, aha, that's a Cepheid variable, I know what its brightness is. Okay? If it's got a period of, what's this, 40 days or whatever, and plot that on my graph, and I know immediately its actual brightness, not just its apparent brightness, its actual luminosity. That makes Cepheid variables a standard candle. Because there is a relationship between their period and their brightness, we can tell a Cepheid's brightness just by looking at it. Now, in order to figure that out in the first place, there had to be some Cepheid variables close enough to us that we could measure their distance using parallax. That's how we figured out this actual brightness in the first place for the nearby ones. But once we've done this for the nearby ones, now we can look anywhere in the universe and see a Cepheid variable and say, hey, that's one of those. What's its period? Now I know what its brightness is. So Cepheid variables are a type of standard candle. They're objects of a known brightness, or at least knowable brightness. And once you know something's brightness, you can determine its distance. Very, very important for the science of astronomy and the history of astronomy. When we talk about Hubble and the Big Bang will mention the fact that nowadays we know there are other galaxies. This is the Andromeda Galaxy. How do we know that the Andromeda Galaxy is millions of light years away from the Earth? The way we know is in the 19, late 1920s, Edwin Hubble, the guy we named a telescope after, looked at the Andromeda Galaxy and saw some Cepheid variable stars he saw some stars that varied their brightness over time and he said, aha, that's a Cepheid variable. Cepheid variable stars have a relationship between their period and their actual brightness. So if I measure, say, the period of uh, the change in brightness of this star and graph it and find that period, I can go to my little chart I made for Cepheid variables and I can determine the actual honest to goodness brightness of that star. That's how we know, and have known since the 1920s, that the Andromeda Galaxy is millions of light years away. It is a separate galaxy from the Milky Way. We did not know that before the 1920s. We did not know there were other galaxies other than the Milky Way until the early, just barely 100 years ago. Actually, a little bit less than 100 years ago. That's kind of remarkable, and it's something I'll mention again, I think, um, throughout the course. Our modern picture of the scale of the universe, the fact that there are other galaxies that are millions of light years away, is less than a century old. And arguably, that sense of the scope of the universe is not kind of commonly shared knowledge among human beings. Uh, I don't think we think of the universe is being a million times bigger than we thought it was in 1900, but it is. Another thing that sometimes happens in galaxies is stars blow up. That's called a supernova. When a star in a galaxy goes supernova, that star briefly gets billions of times brighter than it was before. There are certain kinds of supernovas called type 1 supernovas. What's the difference between a type 1 and a type 2 and a type 1a and a type 2a? We'll save that for later. Suffice it to say, there are certain kinds of supernova explosions that we can identify by how quickly they brighten that are always the same brightness. The thing that makes them happen always happens in the same way. And so when it happens, these explosions are always the same brightness, always the same luminosity. Which means, when we see one, we can say, aha, 
That's a type 1 supernova. I know how luminous those are. Therefore, I know how far away that explosion is just by looking at it. Okay, so type 1a supernovas are a standard candle for astronomers. They are a phenomenon that's always the same brightness. And whenever there's a phenomenon that's always the same brightness, the same luminosity, we can tell how far away that thing is. These different methods of measuring distances to things that are far away uh, overlap one another. For very, very nearby stars, we can use parallax. There are a few nearby uh, Cepheid variable stars. We can use parallax to measure the distance to them too. And using that, we create a new distance tool, the standard candle of Cepheid variables, that we can use to measure distances to things far away. There are also type 1 supernovas. Some of them are as close as Cepheid variables, so we can calibrate the brightness of a type 1 supernova against the Cepheid variable. And then we can use type 1 supernovas, which are always the same brightness, to measure distances to things that are too far away to see a Cepheid variable. Cepheid variable is just a regular star. You can't see the individual stars in a galaxy that's 4 billion light years away. But if one of the stars blows up and is a billion times brighter than usual, you can see that. So type 1 supernovas are out to a, they're good measurement tools to a further distance out. When you get very far away, we can actually use the expansion of the universe, the rate at which galaxies are moving apart from one another, which we figured out using type 1 supernovas. We can use Hubble's law of the expanding universe to calculate the distance to galaxies that are 8, 9, 10, 11 billion light years away. This calibrated series of distance measurement tools is sometimes called the cosmic distance ladder. The first step is parallax, the next step is Cepheids, the next step is type 1 supernovas, the next step are cosmological things like Hubble's law. You will notice if you look back into old astronomy books, our number for the age of the universe has changed a lot, even over the past couple of decades. Now, if you open your astronomy book, it says that the Big Bang happened 13.6 billion years ago. If you pick up an astronomy book that's 15 years old, it might have said 13.9. If you pick up an astronomy book that's 20 years old, it might have said 15 billion years ago. Um, why does that number keep changing? Is the age of the universe changing? No, the age of the universe isn't changing. What's changing is our ability to accurately measure distances to very, very, very far away galaxies. That's what we need to do to determine how fast they're moving away and how long ago they would have all been in the same place. So the tools of astronomy are constantly improving so the numbers we get from astronomy are constantly changing. And the uh, calibration of these dis different parts of the distance ladder, where they overlap, changes every decade or so. As we launch better satellites, as we make better measurements of parallax, as we detect more and more supernovas and more and more distant galaxies. So that's not a bug in science. That's a feature. That's how science is supposed to work. As our measurements get better, our numbers get better and change. If your book says that the time since the Big Bang is 13.64 billion years, don't take that four very seriously. In another 10 years, it might be 13.62 or 13.69 or whatever. Um, these measurements are hard to make, and therefore um, they always have a little bit of uncertainty associated with them, and that is a natural part of scientific measurements. So as we go on through the course, we will talk about um, how far away things are as if that's an easy thing to know. It is not. It is a difficult thing to know. Um, and a lot of our new scientific instrumentation is devoted to looking at things that are further and further and further away because measuring the distance to those things that are further and further and further away gives us information to calibrate this so-called cosmic distance ladder.